The Millennium Graduate Student Contest is organized by the Technology Academy of Finland and is part of this Millennium Innovation Forum. And to be able to participate for this contest, the candidates had to be doctoral students at any of the Millennium Partners. Uh, that could be from the Millennium Technology Prize or the partnering Finnish universities, the Technical Research Center of Finland, VTT, or any of the other Millennium Innovation Forum partners. And to go a little bit back in time, this contest started already in September, while the students were allowed to send in their submission on their doctoral studies. And an interdisciplinary jury has selected the five candidates of today who will be pitching in front of you. Each of these pitches identify a challenge and they describe a proposed solution and they will be, uh, uh, they will be scored according to the following two criteria. The first criteria the jury will be looking at is how well um, or how novel and innovative the idea is. And in this criteria, they will be looking at how clear and convincing the proposed uh, or the defined opportunity and problem is, but also how believable the proposed solution is. And for example, they look at the feasibility and the time to market, for example. The second criteria they will be judging on is uh, that the idea needs to be relevant, uh, it needs to have a scientific and a societal importance. So for this criteria, um, the impact of the idea is, is crucial and that will be questioned. Uh, but also looking at the size of the targeted population that this would solve. The three best pitches of today, they will be uh, receiving an award as an encouragement grant for their recognition of novel, impactful, innovative scientific activity. And the three awards that will be handed out later today, they are coming from the Swedish Academy of Engineering and Sciences in Finland, the Nokia Foundation, and the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters. But before we now head to our first pitch, I'd like to introduce our expert jury of today. So if they could start coming towards the stage, that would be amazing also. Um, so our first jury member is the chair of the jury. He is also chair of delegation of the Finnish Foundation of uh, Technology Promotion, TES, and CEO of Falcon Leader, OU. Please come to the stage, Jarmo Halikas. And our next jury member is uh, uh, a senior advisor in computational sciences at Aalto University and is the president of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters. Please welcome Professor Kimo Kaski. <laughs> then our third member of the jury has a long and holistic experience in the front-end R&D and commercialization of new services and technologies. He is currently the director of research to business strategy at Nokia Technologies and also a board member of the Nokia Foundation Please welcome Dr. Yuka Rantala. And then our last member of the jury, definitely not the least, she is an experienced R&D manager in the energy technology at Valmet. She is currently a member of the Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences in Finland. Please welcome Sonja Enestam. Thank you, jury members, for being here, and if the members could take their seats, but I'd like to have Jarmo at least still on stage, because as chair of the jury, you can join me here. Yeah, okay. I'd like to ask you a question regarding these pitches. You have a tough decision for today to make. There's five excellent candidates, but what are you expecting from these pitches today? Or what do you hope to hear? Yeah. Unfortunately, the pitches are quite short one, and, and, and uh, that's why they have to be very understandable for, for the people who have a common technical background. And, uh, and we expect that, uh, that, that these presentations are so understandable that all in this audience can understand what is the basic idea and where are these ideas going and what are the possibility, possibilities of these ideas in the future. So right. that's my, our main target. Let's hope they can deliver yeah. that, that goal then. Yeah, so okay. You can, 
get your seat in front of the stage there with the rest of the jury members. And with that, our jury is announced, and I hope you are all ready now, because I'd like to ask you the question, are you ready for some high-faced, dynamic three-minute pitches, which are going to be at technologies and research that could change our lives? And I hope that answer is yes, because let's get started with our first candidate of today. Our first candidate is a fellow researcher at VTT. He is also a doctoral candidate at Aalto University. And he is working in the functional cellulose team, where his work is focusing on assembling high-performance nanocellulosic structures. His pitch today will be about turning pollutants into products with next-generation leaf-inspired cell factories. Representing VTT, please welcome to the stage Ville Rissanen. Thank you. So, let's kick this off. Microalgae. What does that word make you think of? Maybe a scene like this when you wanted to go swimming, or even something like this. But I want to change that into this, from pollutants to products. And as you can see, for the algae food industry, this is already old news. But there is so much more untapped potential in microalgae besides just food production. Did you know that we can use them as alternatives for fossil-based industry, as algae cell factories for sustainable production of chemicals? How this works is that the algae use photosynthesis to take carbon dioxide from air and turn it into different products, such as biofuels or polymer precursors like ethylene. But I think the coolest example here is to take the cyanotoxins and create cancer drugs out of them. So now we're talking about a pharmaceutical ingredient with a price of thousands of euros per gram of product. So that sounds like a dream scenario, right? But while there have been many startups trying to make this dream into a reality, most of them have not been able to succeed. Why? Because there is a bottleneck in cost efficiency. Simply put, the traditional cell factory systems um, use a lot of water and energy, and they're able to get only a fraction out of the algae's potential out in return. But what is in, instead of this? We had this, a solid-state cell factory. By squeezing the cells into this thin matrix layer, we're able to reduce the amount of water by over 50 times, and in the solid state, the cells are actually able to operate more efficiently, kind of like a living solar panel. So now, the real challenge is, how to make structures like these. And our solution is nanocellulose. It is a next-generation bioproduct that can be made from basically any cellulose-containing material, and it can form these strong and versatile uh, matrix hydrogels that are fully biocompatible with the cells. And we have shown that they're able to outperform conventional matrix alternatives in these challenging bioreactor conditions. And I believe that this interdisciplinary understanding of both cell engineering and biomaterials technology is what brings us beyond the state of the arts. I believe that we're the first ones uh, building a, a demonstrator out of this kind of system. And while we're still more on the bench scale, uh, we do have an SME involved, and there are no material restrictions for upscaling this kind of system. So this is, of course, a team effort. Uh, we have a project called Future Leaf, and if you want to join this revolution, check us out and let us know. Thank you. And thank you, Villa, for your pitch. And please stay ready at the side of the stage, as there will be questions from the jury coming later on, so you will be asked to come back on stage later on. So let's move to our next candidate of today, who is also a doctoral candidate at Aalto University. She started her studies there in 2020, originally coming from Iran, where she did her master's degree in ceramic sciences and engineering. Her thesis at Aalto University is focusing on additive manufacturing of solid oxide fuel cells. Pitching her idea today of inkjet printing, uh, which she states actually to be the savior of renewable energy technologies. Next on stage is Zainas Zarabi. Thank you 
So let's just start with this question that how quickly can we hope that the renewable energy technologies like wind and solar powers replace the fossil fuels and become the primary solution to our energy crisis? Although the renewables have a market size value of almost $1 trillion in 2022 and the progress prospect looks promising, in reality, it's extremely challenging to switch everything to new renewables, at least at this moment and with the current limitations of raw materials. As wind and solar powers have a dilute energy nature and they are not always available, we need sophisticated energy storage systems to store their energy, like high-performance batteries. But these storage technologies require 40 times more lithium, followed by 20 to 25 times more nickel, cobalt, and graphite to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, according to IEA report. And as the Earth resources are limited, the final product price, the green energy, will be sky high. So we have to find a solution. But what if we decrease the need of these precious materials in the batteries and enhance their performance at the same time. Well, that's what we'll do in this project, and the key is in the fabrication technique. Inkjet printing is a well-known fabrication technique which is cost-effective, mask-free, and precise, with the hidden advantage. It can produce batteries electrodes with almost one-tenth effective material and enhance the performance by three times comparing to the other conventional fabrication techniques. Inkjet printing spreads the active material uniformly on the surface, develops the surface microstructure, and increases the specific surface area, leading to a conjugated, nanostructured morphology with maximized reaction sites. This hierarchical electrode design can boost the dominating electrochemical process inside of the battery's electrode, like charge transfer and ion transportation. And I will develop these inks and tune the printer properties to fabricate this magical electrode. Moreover, inkjet printing has another sustainable advantage. It produces zero waste. So, one-tenth effective material, triple performance and zero waste, making a bridge to accelerate our path towards the renewables. Thank you. And thank you, Zainas, for your pitch. And it seems microalgae has inspired more people today to work on that topic, as our third candidate will pitch her idea for using it in engineering nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria for solar-driven bioproduction. Her background is in biochemistry, and she's working in her doctoral research at the photo Photosynthetic Microbes Group at the Turku University. Uh, she has joined this team only a year ago, so she's very early in her studies still. Prior to her studies at Turku University, she obtained her master's degree in Germany at the Technical University of Munich. Next on stage is Elisa Werner. This comes from trees. And this comes from algae, more precisely microalgae in the oceans. They provide the oxygen for every second breath that we take, and we are only too happy to recycle that oxygen for them back into carbon dioxide which they need to grow. However, lately we've become just a little bit too good at that, by adding the burning of fossil fuel to the mix. Well, wouldn't it be great for more algae to grow to get rid of our excess CO2? Well, it's not as simple as that. You've all heard of toxic microalgae blooms devastating marine ecosystems. But there are also the good microalgae, the ones that we can grow in bioreactors and that can produce useful products such as oils, pigments, vitamins or biofuel. However, they tend to produce only minute amounts, just enough for their own needs, or they might not produce the products we're interested in at all. This is where we come in, the bioengineers. To us, microalgae are fascinating biofactories capable of turning CO2 and sunlight into oxygen and biomass. In a first step, they harvest light energy via antenna complexes, 
which split water into oxygen and protons and thereby generate a tiny photocurrent running through protein complexes in the membranes of the thylakoid compartments, charging them like little batteries. Ultimately, energy equivalents in form of the molecules ATP and NADPH are produced, which drive carbon fixation. By stealing off electrons from this tiny photocurrent in form of NADPH and redirecting it towards our product of interest, we can achieve whole cell biotransformation. It's my goal to transform the multicellular blue-green algae Anabana into a bioproduction platform which is capable of performing these biotransformations in its vegetative cells. But Anabana is actually pretty good at multitasking. It can differentiate some of its vegetative cells into heterocysts. Now, heterocysts are practically devoid of oxygen in order to enable nitrogen fixation, which is an oxygen-sensitive process. A byproduct of nitrogen fixation is hydrogen production. Now, biohydrogen production in other microalgae has so far been hampered by the oxygen sensitivity of the process, and the microoxic heterocysts of Anabana could provide an innovative solution to that. Just how much further could we take microalgae biotechnology in the future? Will our cities turn green with microalgae bioreactors on every building? Will we travel to outer space feeding and breathing of microalgae? Or could we even terraform other planets using microalgae? So the next time you walk by a pond and you see some of this murky green stuff in there, take a moment to be grateful and take a deep breath. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. That was a perfectly three-minute pitch on the seconds exactly. So let's move from Germany to the western lakeland of Finland, where our next candidate is representing the University of Uvescula. Uh, he has his background in applied mathematics and computational sciences and works in multi-objective comp uh, multi optimization group there. He has focused his work on developing new, innovative decision-supporting tools. The title of his pitch today is Explainable Multi-Objective Optimization. So I hope he can explain us all today the topic, because next on stage is Giovanni Misita Misitano. Apologies. <laughs> Data. We have more and more data available each day from a plethora of different fields, from industry to the public sector. But what do we do with this data? We end up making decisions, and these decisions are a result of solving problems with multiple conflicting objectives. Often, the most cost-efficient option is not the most environmentally friendly. Behind these decisions stands a decision-maker with vast domain expertise. However, this expertise is often left untapped in traditional decision support tools. How could we incorporate this expertise better in decision support tools? I think we need better tools. But this is not enough. We need to be able to also understand how these tools work. We need to be able to communicate the reasoning behind the decisions made using these tools. Uh, otherwise, how can we convince shareholders to move towards a more environmentally friendly option at the cost of additional revenue? How to justify this? What we need is explainability. I believe explainability must be considered most of all in the decision support tools we use. Uh, I propose a new paradigm in decision support, which is explainable multi-objective optimization. It is able to handle database problems with multiple conflicting objectives by incorporating preference information from a domain expert. On top of this, it is able to explain its behavior and, for example, explain how it has generated solution candidates. Explainability enhances the knowledge of the decision maker by providing them insights about the various conflicting objectives in the problems. Sometimes even a small loss in revenue can lead to a huge gain in sustainability. Many traditional decision support tools fail to communicate this. The beneficiaries of this new breed of decision support tools are domain experts from various industries, policymakers, shareholders, and the general public. At the University of Vascula, we 
at the multi-objective optimization research group are pioneers of advancing explainable multi-objective optimization. We have applied all tools in the past to finish forest management and healthcare. And believe me when I tell you, explainability, it can sell in decision support. It is my mission to develop explainable multi-objective optimization to a mature state where it can be applied globally by researchers and practitioners alike. We develop our tools as open source software, which is openly available, which promotes the renewal and openness of science. I believe each of us has a right to an explanation as we move more and more towards using computational tools to make decisions. I have a genuine passion to develop the next generation of explainable and human comprehensible tools to help our society move towards a more sustainable, fair, and most of all, explainable well, future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Giovanni. And as most of us are, have been just experiencing 5G on our mobile phones in our pockets, probably, our final candidate of today is a doctoral researcher working on the 6G flagship coordinated by the University of Oulu. His research is focusing on machine-type connectivity over satellites and non-terrestrial uh, networks for the machine-based applications operating in remote areas. Pitching his idea today of direct-to-satellite connectivity to combat the digital divide, give a warm applause to Mohamed Asad Ula. Wireless communication is the cardiovascular system of our modern society. Unfortunately, today, only 10% of the Earth's surface has connectivity. In fact, nearly 3 billion peoples and remote areas still do not have coverage, which creates a big digital divide. These days, new solutions are emerging to satisfy humans' access needs. But how about global coverage for machines? Sadly, today, there is no solution. We may think solving this problem would be easy just by extending our existing terrestrial networks, but this would be neither feasible nor sustainable. And I will help you to explain why. First, it is not always possible to build networks in fragile areas such as the ocean or the Arctic region. We cannot build network in ocean. Secondly, even if this was possible, it would mean building millions of miles of more roads, installing more cables, and using more electricity to power and support these networks. Today, ICT sector already accounts up to 9% of the global electricity consumption and 4% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. If we build more terrestrial networks to combat the digital divide, the situation became worse, not better. Therefore, we need a new sustainable solution. And here, my research comes. The solution I offer is Direct to satellite connectivity, what makes this idea special? Well, first, these IoT devices, these are energy efficient, affordable, and compact. And this technology can work on license-free frequency bands, which means we don't have to buy the radio spectrum, which makes the solution low cost. Third, this technology can support a massive number of users. On top of that, this idea is based on sustainability and energy efficiency. How? Satellites use solar panels to generate electricity, and IoT devices use batteries that can last for years. A single LEO satellite can serve an area up to 20 million square kilometers, which is twice the size of entire Europe. If we use my direct to satellite connectivity idea, we don't need to worry about building any additional infrastructure or generating more electricity to power the networks. Beyond the scientific impact, this technology will also have massive environment, massive societal impact. The product and services based on this concept can help to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This technology is an innovation for a better life, and it can be used to build a wide range of applications. For example, situational awareness for ships, smart agricultures, offshore wind farm, as well as wildlife and nature monitoring. Just to mention a few, thank you.
Thank you, Mohammed. And with that, Mohammed's pitch, the last one of the five candidates today, we are rounding this part up, but not yet immediately, because there will still be some questions from the jury. So I'd like to invite all five candidates back to the stage. Some applause is allowed, yes. <laughs> So the jury has submitted a question for each individual of you. So I'll go over it in the order of the pitches, how they went. So the question to you, Vila, is there any larger scale pilot plants that use the technology uh, or this technology solution? The short answer is not yet. So the, the cell factory systems have been attempted many times, like I mentioned. But we are actually now working together with one SME partner who has been able to make these high-value pharmaceuticals into already profitable products. And by making their systems more efficient, I think we can open the door to upscaling these systems. All right, thank you. And Seinas, the question from the jury to you is, how near is the commercialization of this uh, use of the film printing technology and what would be the first application uh, for the technology to use? So uh, I think as we already have the equi equipment and you know we can modify the equipment for different applications so I can say that it's near the commercialization and also there are many different applications for this particular uh, fabrication technique as it modifies the surface so everything like supercapacitors, lithium ion batteries, uh, solid oxide fuel cells, everything that is connected with surface reactions can get benefits from this uh, fabrication technique. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, hopefully the jury is satisfied with that answer. Yeah. So let's move to Elisa, the question for you. How far away is the commercial application for this project production method? Thank you. Um, so in case of Anabana, we had two different levels actually. So we would be at technology readiness level two for um, the biotransformation part and at level three for the hydrogen part. So hydrogen production, we have already um, sustained production for 10 months, actually in um, immobilized in nanocellulose. So we're also collaborating with, uh, with this group on that. Um, for the biotransformation, we have all the, the tools in cynical systems, but we have the genetic tools to um, also apply them to um, Anabana. And uh, we have operational uh, A4 size um, biopanels in our group that are already operational and on lab scale. All right, thank you, Elisa. Giovanni, question yes. for you is, can you tell one example of a case where the presented optimization concept is used in a real situation? <laughs> Yes, uh, we have a case study in my most recent paper titled Towards Explainable Interactive Multi-Object Optimization, where we have a case study with a representative from Luke who solves a simplified problem in forest management. And we run this case study uh, and we found out that explainability was really met with, with, with warm from the decision maker, who is an expert in, 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 in forest management. So, that is maybe the best example I can give you. We have other things under the hood, but that's the most concrete one I would like to give you today. All right, thank you for your answer. And then last, Mohammed, what are the limitations for applications which can be used by the concept presented by you? Yes, so limitations will be like this technology can support massive number of users. For example, in current date, one gateway like one receiver can support 11 million packets per day. But in future, as the number of devices is increasing day by day, and there could be more devices, then the actual problem is scalability, like how we can support the devices if the order is more than 11 million. All right, yeah. thank you. And I think they deserve another round of applause. <laughs> yeah. And now that we have heard five pitches, five hopefully good answers to the questions you submitted, um, the jury will start their deliberation on the deciding of the winners of the awards that will be handed out late today at five o'clock on the main stage. And for the viewers at home, that would be right after the resilience uh, session. And thank you all here in Helsinki for joining the session. And for you online, 